Welcome to Colorado Probation Supervising Domestic Violence Offenders. In this video, we'll discuss the procedures and limitations placed on individuals who have been sentenced to probation for domestic violence related offenses. We'll also review your rights as a victim under the Colorado Victim Rights Act. We'll begin with two basic rights under the Colorado Victim Rights Act the right to notification and the right to be heard. Specifically, when you opt in to the Victims Notification Program, you will be contacted whenever a critical stage in the criminal justice process occurs. For example, while the defendant is on probation, you would be notified if and when the defendant requests a reduction in the amount of time he or she will serve on probation has a summons or warrant issued for his or her arrest, or transfers supervision to a different state or district. Your rights are not limited to notification, however. Whenever an offender goes to court, you also have the right to be heard. As a victim, you can make a statement to the court whenever a hearing is held regarding any of the status changes previously mentioned. You can make a statement in person or in writing. In fact, from this point forward, the amount of involvement you have with the probation process is entirely up to you. Victim Services recognizes that individuals work through their issues in different ways and at different rates. Please know that we are here to assist you through the process to the best of our ability. Thank you in advance for watching this video. If, at the completion of this presentation, you still have questions about the probation process or your rights, please don't hesitate to call your local probation office and ask for the Victim Services Officer. You can also call the Office for Victim Programs at the Division of Criminal Justice at 303-239-5719 or call toll-free at 1-888-282-1080. Victim Services. As the victim of a crime that falls under the Colorado Victim Rights Act, or VRA, there are a number of services available to you. Some services are provided by the state, while others are offered by private organizations. In this section, we'll discuss the steps you can take to access these services, including victim opt in notification, victim compensation. Referrals to Counseling, Support Groups, and Other Community Agencies. At this time, you may already be familiar with your opt-in rights under the VRA. To be notified of critical status stages while the defendant is on probation, all you have to do is fill out this request form, identifying the case and your contact information. If you don't have a copy of this form, please contact your local probation department and one will be sent to you. Another possible option is the Victim's Compensation Fund, which may be available to assist you with expenses incurred because of the crime. Compensation that is available for victims may include, but is not limited to, doctor, dentist, or hospital bills, physical therapy, and mental health counseling. If your home was broken into as part of the crime, Victim compensation might be available to assist you with the replacement of doors, locks, or windows. If you have suffered any of these expenses, please contact your Victim Services Officer as soon as possible. There are time limits for making compensation requests, and because of the high demand for funding, there are limits on the amount of compensation you can receive. Protection Orders in Colorado, there are four types of protection orders, civil, criminal, emergency, and domestic relations. It is important that you understand the type of protection order you are requesting, as well as the terms and conditions included therein. Next, we'll look at each type of order more specifically, beginning with civil protection orders. You may request and obtain more than one protection order against an offender at one time. 
If you obtain a protection order, make sure that you keep a copy of it with you at all times. Victims of domestic abuse often request civil protection orders, which can be issued by county or municipal courts. Civil protection orders may include requirements that exclude an offender from a residence or other locations, restrain an individual from having contact with or abusing a victim, identified family members, and even pets, require respondents to provide temporary financial assistance to petitioners for expenses such as mortgages, rents, utilities, and medical and child care. A judge can issue a temporary civil protection order for up to 14 days. At that time, the order will expire unless the protected person returns to court and requests that it be continued or made permanent. Permanent orders remain in effect until they are modified or vacated by a court. Courts are required to issue criminal protection orders in cases in which a defendant is charged with a crime involving domestic violence. Before a defendant can be released from custody in a domestic violence case, he or she must acknowledge the criminal protection order in court and on the record. This prevents a defendant from claiming that he or she was confused as to whether he or she could contact the victim. Criminal protection orders remain in effect until the case is dismissed or the defendant completes the sentence, including discharge from probation or incarceration. In criminal settings, courts are allowed to place a number of conditions and prohibitions on a defendant, such as refrain from harassing, injuring, molesting, intimidating, threatening, retaliating against, or tampering with a victim or witness. Order the defendant to vacate the home of the victim and stay away from any other location the victim is likely to be found. Refrain from contacting or directly or indirectly communicating with the victim. In addition, defendants can be prohibited from possessing or controlling a firearm or other weapon or, in appropriate circumstances, from possessing or consuming alcoholic beverages or controlled substances. Emergency protection orders are issued outside of regular court hours at the request of law enforcement. These orders expire at the end of the next judicial business day unless continued by the courts. Domestic relations protection orders are issued as part of a domestic relations case, such as a dissolution of marriage, divorce, or allocation of parental responsibilities, custody. It is important to inform the court of other protection orders that may be in existence. What happens if a court issues a protection order and one person is excluded from a common residence? In that case, a civil standby allows the excluded person to return to the residence one time to obtain sufficient undisputed personal effects that are necessary to maintain a normal standard of living. A civil standby proceeding only applies during the temporary protection order period and the excluded individual must be accompanied by a peace officer. After being personally served with the order or acquiring actual knowledge of the contents of the protection order from the court or law enforcement, a violation may occur when a restrained person disobeys any of the terms or conditions of a protection order. If you have a question concerning a protection order or you believe a violation has occurred, please contact your local law enforcement agency. Safety Planning You have the right to a violence-free relationship. No matter what your significant other tells you, the abuse is not your fault. If your safety is at risk, you may want to contact your local victim services agency to create a safety plan for yourself and others. This is particularly true if you decide to leave your significant other. For many, breaking up will increase the danger in the short term. Emotions can run high, and your partner could become angry, even violent, when he or she learns they are losing control of the situation. It is critical that you find support. Safety plans are fluid and ever-changing, depending on risk, situation, and circumstances. 
you should create a safety plan with community resources and family support in mind and not rely solely on law enforcement or court protections. Again, safety planning is unique in each case and requires a collaborative effort. Confide in someone you trust for support and contact your victim services officer to create a detailed safety plan that may include safe houses or shelter referrals. Sharing Custody and Safe Exchange When a civil restraining order or criminal protection order is in place, sharing child custody and child exchanges can be complicated. This section will provide you with information about potential solutions to this problem. As discussed earlier, victims of domestic violence can file for temporary care and control of the children through a civil protection order. Those seeking permanent custody need to petition their local domestic relations courts for allocation of parental responsibilities. After a child custody order is in place, local resources can assist you with safe child exchanges and supervised parenting time. Safe exchange programs offer parents a safe place to drop off and pick up their children without having direct contact with the other parent. Safe child exchanges can also be conducted at your local law enforcement agency or with a responsible third-party adult. Supervised parenting programs offer an opportunity for parents to have time with their children in a safe environment while encouraging healthy parent-child interactions in a home-like setting. The highest priority in both programs is the safety of the children and adult victims. Please contact your victim services officer to find out whether your jurisdiction offers these community resources. What is probation? In general, the primary objective of every probation department is to help protect victims and the community from future violence. We accomplish this by monitoring offenders' behavior in the community, which holds them accountable for their past actions and also motivates them to take the steps necessary to be successful in their current treatment program. The amount of contact an offender will have with his or her probation officer is determined by the level of risk. We use a variety of assessments and criminal history checks to determine risk. The higher the level of risk, the more contact an offender will have with his or her probation officer and treatment providers. Probation officers meet with offenders in a variety of locations, including home, office, treatment program, or place of employment. Home visits are conducted randomly and can occur at night or on weekends. In other words, at times when the offender does not expect to see a probation officer. A probation officer's job is to ensure that offenders comply with the orders of the court and their prescribed treatment programs. Probation has the authority to utilize incentives and sanctions to motivate offenders to accept responsibility for their actions. While not every violation will result in a revocation and return to court, probation will make every effort to keep them in compliance. Again, probation's primary concern is promoting victim and community safety. If you have questions or concerns related to a potential probation violation, please don't hesitate to contact your district's probation department and ask for the victim services officer. If you feel the matter is urgent and involves community safety or a legal violation, contact local law enforcement immediately. Approved treatment programs. In this section, we'll explain a little more about what an offender will encounter in treatment and how a multidisciplinary treatment team, or MTT, made up of a probation officer, treatment provider, and victim representative work together to improve community safety and make joint decisions about an offender's program. A victim advocate who is part of a treatment agency will attempt to contact you with information about the offender's treatment program and answer any questions you may have. As discussed earlier, 
When offenders enter into a domestic violence treatment program, the goals are to have them accept responsibility for their abusive behavior and reduce the risk of further abuse. The responsibility for accepting their behavior and making appropriate changes always remains with the offender. Whether they are successful or not usually depends on their motivation. The first stage of treatment is the offender evaluation. The treatment provider will review many sources of information, such as police reports on incidents of domestic violence, additional criminal history, as well as behavioral history of abuse. The treatment provider will interview the offender, as well as conduct several assessments to determine the offender's level of risk. The treatment provider and the MTT will then discuss the findings and determine the appropriate treatment level. There are three levels of treatment. Level A, low intensity. Level B, moderate intensity. And level C, high intensity. Depending on an offender's progress or lack thereof, a level can move up or down. In other words, an offender might begin in a level C high intensity program, then have it reduced after demonstrating and meeting the core competencies listed in his or her treatment program. Offenders are required to actively participate in their treatment program. Participation means offenders can understand, demonstrate, and apply what they are learning. This occurs in various ways, such as through homework assignments, journaling, role-playing, and active group participation. In addition, depending on individual needs, an offender may be required to attend additional programs, such as substance abuse or alcohol treatment. In most cases, the multidisciplinary treatment team will meet every two to three months to review new information it has obtained about an offender's treatment progress. The team will revise the plan as necessary, provide the offender with a progress assessment, and consider changes to the level of treatment. Probation will provide input regarding compliance and any new criminal activity. The MTT will also consider information obtained from other sources, such as family, social services, or mental health providers. There are three types of discharge. Treatment completion, unsuccessful discharge from treatment, and administrative discharge. An MTT will only assign treatment completion after an offender can demonstrate understanding and use of the core competencies, have no new risk factors, and complete all elements of the treatment plan. Power and control. Domestic violence is almost always about a perpetrator's desire to maintain power and control over the victim and his or her life. The graphic on the screen depicts actions frequently taken by domestic violence offenders to achieve their goals. At the center of the wheel, or the hub, is power and control, while the eight spokes of the wheel represent specific behaviors or tactics frequently used by offenders. We'll review each of these actions next. References in the wheel tend to identify females as the victims in relationships. While statistics indicate that most domestic violence victims are female, there are also female offenders and male victims and domestic violence in same-sex relationships. The first book we'll review is when an offender uses intimidation to exercise power and control over the victim. This includes behaviors such as scaring the victim with looks, actions, or gestures. It might also include destroying property or abusing a pet that belongs to the victim. Other physical actions such as punching the wall next to the victim's head or cleaning a firearm at the kitchen table can also be used to intimidate or scare a victim. Moving clockwise, the next spoke describes how offenders can use isolation to control a relationship. This can include physical isolation, such as moving the victim a long distance from family and friends, or prohibiting the victim from using a telephone or leaving the house without permission. 
which limits a victim's ability to contact individuals who might provide support for his or her independence. The next spoke on the power and control wheel discusses behaviors of offenders who use emotional abuse. Examples include making derogatory comments about a spouse's abilities or appearance. Perpetrators can also play mind games with a victim to make them feel guilty about their own behavior. Next, we'll look at economic abuse. This could include an offender who refuses to allow a spouse to have a job or participate in financial decisions. Even if the victim is allowed to work, the offender may control the victim's paycheck as well as control the family's checkbook. The next spoke is sexual abuse, which includes making the victim do sexual acts she does not want to, physically attacking sexual parts of the body, or treating the victim as a sex object. The next spoke describes a situation in which an offender uses children to exercise power and control. For an example, an offender might have children relay hurtful messages to the victim. Or an offender might threaten the victim that he or she will never see the children again if he or she reports the abuse to authorities. Using male privilege involves male offenders who hold strong beliefs on the roles of men and women in a relationship. In this situation, male offenders will attempt to control the victim by making the victim feel like a servant or not allowing the victim a voice in major decisions. The last spoke we'll review on the power and control wheel is threats. These include direct threats toward the victim's personal safety or toward individuals who are important to the victim. They can also take the form of indirect threats and coercion, including statements by offenders that they will report the victim to authorities, such as law enforcement or social services. It might even include threats that the perpetrator will commit suicide. That completes our review of the power and control wheel. As you may have noticed, some abusive behaviors can fall in more than one category. However, the importance of the power and control wheel is not necessarily helping a reader identify a specific category for every abusive behavior. Rather, the power of the wheel is helping victims recognize behaviors that may be occurring in their own lives so they can take positive steps to break the cycle of violence. If you would like to learn more about the use of power and control in a relationship, please contact your local victim services officer or a domestic violence victim advocate in your community. Cycle of Abuse We just reviewed how an offender can use power and control within an unhealthy relationship. Next, we'll look at how the behavior often turns to a cycle of abuse. At the right side of the screen, we see a phase in a relationship that is titled calm. At this point, it is relatively serene. No abuse is occurring, and the offender may act as if no abuse has ever occurred. Moving clockwise, the cycle turns to the tension-building phase. In this period, the victim and others in the household often feel like they are walking on eggshells. The offender begins to get angry over even minor issues, with the victim trying to keep the offender calm. Unfortunately, despite the best efforts of the victim, the cycle of abuse often moves into the explosive phase. At this time, significant abuse occurs in the form of physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, or all of the above. Finally, the cycle moves into what is described as the honeymoon or reconciliation phase. At this time, the offender will usually apologize, sometimes profusely, for the abuse, promising the victim that it will never happen again. The offender may still blame the victim for the abuse or deny that it happened, but he or she will frequently buy gifts or do special things for the victim. Unfortunately, the cycle often returns, moving from the reconciliation phase to the calm phase and then back to the tension-building and abuse phases. 
Of course, the timing and severity of the abuse varies with each relationship. For some, it may occur once or twice a year. In other relationships, the cycle might occur monthly, weekly, or even more frequently. Unfortunately, research shows that the level of violence within a cycle generally increases with each occurrence, placing the victim and others in greater danger of injury or death with each cycle. On average, it takes domestic violence victims seven cycles of violence before they report the behavior to law enforcement. In some occasions, victims have endured the cycle of abuse dozens of times before escaping the relationship. This video was developed to help empower victims of domestic abuse by providing information about your rights as a crime victim, as well as describe how offender programs are managed in Colorado. Remember, you can always change your mind. If you decide not to be involved with probation at this point, you may contact us later to receive more information or become more involved. Probation takes supervision of domestic violence offenders very seriously. We want them to succeed in the treatment process. At the same time, we want to assist crime victims as much as possible. If you have questions or concerns, please feel free to contact your local probation department at any time. Resources Frequently Asked Questions.